But I do think dubbing is a creative industry and creative localization is creative, right? The technology can get objective things done. Like you could say, yes, that's an accurate translation, but will it have the interpretation that a human has? Welcome, everyone, and welcome to Slater Pod. Today, we have on the podcast Chris Reynolds. Chris is the Executive Vice President and General Manager of Worldwide Localization and Fulfillment at Deluxe, their media and entertainment services provider. Hi, Chris, and thanks so much for joining today. Hi, Florian. Great to be here. What part of the world are you joining us from? What country, what city? Joining from Los Angeles, California, in the United States. As somebody in the media business should be joining from. So... Tell us a bit more about your initially for our listeners, for our your professional background, you know, how you got into media and entertainment and, you know, started working in, in localization and, and these this part of the business. Yeah, of course. Um, so for me it all started very young. I've always loved music, literature, film, TV. Um, and from a young age, always wanted to be involved in it somehow. Um, ended up going to school for um, journalism, and then changed uh, and ended up graduating in recording arts. So I started my career as an audio engineer, um, an editor. And then uh, through that, got into film and TV sound, worked my way up to mixing. um, And then as I continued through my career, I started mixing um, localized, uh, centralized mixing for large theatrical films and joined Deluxe, who has a, you know, long history of localization and global distribution. And uh, at this point now, overseeing teams around the world, so in all kinds of countries and regions uh, that are focused on localization and distribution for theatrical, streaming, broadcast, social media, we pretty much hit every of those distribution points. So you know uh, everything from the inside out, from like the very start, like from the, really from the mixing up and and everything. Yeah. Well, I mean, not everything, but yep. Recording, mixing, that's, that's core to my background from a very young age. So tell us a bit more about deluxe services, client segments, kind of how large your organization is. It's very large. Uh, of course, according to our, our research here, you got three units, at least that's what's on the website. You got cinema, localization, and fulfillment. So just tell us a bit more about size, footprint, clients. Yeah. So overall, um, we have close to 4,000 full-time employees around the world. Um, our headquarters are in Burbank, California, Los Angeles area, and um, but we also have a large presence across Europe, in the UK, Spain, France, Germany, um, and then um, in APAC, we're operating, we're actually going through a big expansion, so operating in Korea, Japan, Taiwan, Indonesia, Malaysia, Thailand, Australia. Um, and then we also have uh, a large team in India as well that's been uh, supporting the business for over 20 years. On top of that, we have a massive distributed workforce of linguists and translators, over 5,000 that work on our platform um, every day, localizing in over 100 languages. And then we work with a large network of dubbing studio partners so that we can support every language. Um, We have about over 400 onboarded into our platform that we work with regularly. The three groups at Deluxe, um, cinema really is all about um, mastering and distribution for theatrical release. And what that means is um, doing quality control of the final picture and sound and subtitle elements that come in for theatrical. Every single one actually has to be viewed by a human in a theater, every version and combo before it goes out to theaters. And then the actual distribution to the theaters, be it electronically, um, hard drive, satellite, IP delivery. Um, And that's a a big part of our business. We're operating worldwide for distribution. Um, Localization, of course, is uh, what we're mostly talking about today, but that's the subtitling 
dubbing where you're um, re-recording all the voices and mixing new foreign language versions. Um, we do graphic localization for artwork, both key art that's still images and then uh, motion graphics that are the actual titles or inserts within um, film or television content. Uh, and then we also support accessibility services, which covers things like audio description for the visually impaired. Of course, the um, captions with uh, sounds for the deaf and hard of hearing um, and also sign language. So doing um, more in American sign language over the past year, which has been exciting, but we also support it in some other countries um, and see a growing interest in that. And then lastly, fulfillment um, is about the mastering and distribution of content for any non-theatrical distribution. So in that area, it's the quality control. Um, some of that is the original um, because if it's episodic for streaming or feature for streaming, it's, there's no theatrical QC, so it doesn't go through our cinema team. Um, and then we, we do the quality control. We do have some original post-production um, in certain areas to actually do the original sound and picture work and some visual effects. Um, but then we create the distribution masters and those then go into fulfillment along with all the localized assets after final QC, the audio dubs, subtitles, etc. cetera. Um, and we end up delivering it to any end point, streamers, broadcasters, social media, all around the world. Um, we deliver millions of files every month. It's a massive, high scale, very automated platform on the distribution side for that side of the business. Um, and our customer segments, we service all of the major Hollywood studios. We've been around for over a hundred years. So, um, you know, every major every major Hollywood studio and streamer. We've been a part of all the streaming launches from when iTunes first started offering videos for rent or download to Netflix, to Amazon, to Disney Plus, Paramount Plus, all, all of the streaming uh, platforms out there. Um, and then all of the broadcasters, we actually in our platform deliver to, um, you know, over... 18,000 endpoints and any endpoint is a delivery destination. So it's a, a massive distribution uh, part of our business. And I oversee localization and fulfillment. So that's actually becoming more and more one group. Our customers often buy that as, as one thing, localize and distribute the content. And so um, we found a need to bring those together to be more efficient, better match how our customers think about it. Um, and it's been good. Like our platforms have been coming together on that side, the teams, um, and it helps us be faster and everyone's under pressure to get things out faster and faster these days. I think what people tend to not appreciate, uh, at least I, I, I didn't until I, I learned about it, it's just the, the, the size of these files sometimes, right? It's not like, you know, a hundred megs or five and a megs. I mean, I think these masters are huge, right? And, and that also makes them very tricky to to distribute because people would think distribution, well, you know, send it or, you know, upload it to something. Just tell us a bit more about that. That's just so uh, technically challenging, I guess. Yeah, no, it really is. Uh, the, the masters that we receive are in very large uncompressed formats. So we'll get uh, video masters that are multiple terabytes. Um, we actually recently made the big, I mean, Last year, we made the biggest theatrical delivery ever with Avatar. Um, so both for cinema and for streaming and all the downstream, it's just massive, huge files. And then it gets bigger if it has 3D versions, 2D versions. You end up having 4K UHD versions, HD versions, SD versions. Um, and so, and there's different color spaces too, but these are just enormous files. There's a lot of technical complexity in getting all the different versions right. And then the sound really stacks up too, because it's it's not like you have one French version. You might have a French Atmos version, French 5.1 version, French 2.0, which is left-right version. And each one, a mixer has really spent time making sure it sounds right. 
Um, and then you multiply that by how many languages. And then if you have IMAX for theatrical, you have another sound version. There's other, you know, uh, specific formats that different regions support. So it all really adds up. Uncompressed avatar. Yes, that's, uh, that's going to be a big one. Huge, tons of time pressure and <laughs> got to have a lot of automation to get all the transcodes out because the file in the theater still big but at that point you're talking gigabytes not terabytes so it's a lot of compression still um to get it there and so this week actually uh this week uh, when we were recording the podcast you you announced that you um uh, uh started a partnership with aptech uh you know speech technology company um can you just tell us a bit more about that because that was just in the news this week as we're recording this yeah, no, we're very excited about that. Um, it's a great team at AppTech, some brilliant scientists uh, that have, you know, are really experts in neural language processing and technology. Um, what that is about for us is, you know, Deluxe, we've been around for over 100 years. You can't be around that long without leaning into technology and always being on the forefront of what's happening. I think our customers expect it. We often get, if there's a new format, new process, we're one of the companies that they turn to all the time to say, how do we, how do we do this? How do we figure it out? Um, and so in every aspect of our business, we're always investing in technology. We develop a lot of proprietary technology, but when it comes to um, language processing technology, we've been partnering with different companies, incorporating it into certain workflows, but we had a lot of ideas of how we could, make it work better for our workflows for the media and entertainment industry specifically which is really pretty niche when you think about it um, a lot of the providers focus on broader segments um, be it just consumer use or you know of course you have people focused on book publishing or websites you, you have different focus areas um, and on our side, you know, you'll you'll see a lot of things about, oh, I have speech to text, I have machine translation, I have text to speech, but is it is it actually specific enough to be incorporated in a practical way into the workflow? And for us, the practical implementation, the way that you can improve the quality, the places where you insert it into the workflow, we just wanted more control more access to the scientists that work on that so that we can tailor it to our specific industry needs and more tightly integrate it into our platforms. Yeah, I mean, when you were mentioning these these file size and just the complexity of, of the process, I think it, it, it's so different from, yeah, a website or, you know, a 200-page document where the language is obviously the key challenge, but not all the things around it. Uh, and, and in your case, language is one component. And of course, with, uh, yeah, which is just the, the voice and, 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 and all the other aspects, it's just so much more technical, right? Now, can we talk a bit about, uh, just go away from the tech a bit or just go to the dubbing production, right? Because it involves so many kind of intricacies, uh, voice casting, script, script adaptation, post-production. Just tell us a bit more how, what are some of the key challenges that you're, Still in 2024, what, what you're helping your customers solve now, and you know, the tech is one piece, but just let's remind our listeners a bit about that the, the general dubbing process. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's a fascinating area, especially for those who aren't as familiar with it. It's one of those conversations when you talk to friends or family and they say, "What do you do?" You can end up in a really long conversation when you get into the the dubbing side because they just don't think about about how that happens, you know? Um, but yeah, I mean, it's a, timelines are always very challenging, I'll say. I mean, it's a creative industry and the original version creators, they're never happy, they're never done. It, it, there's a famous saying in entertainment that the film or TV show isn't, isn't done, it just kind of walks out the door on the last day. <laughs> You're finally, everything comes together somebody's announced a release date and the director has to let it go at some point and say good enough um because of that they're always asking for more time right it's it's a creative story they're trying to tell there's a lot of passionate people involved 
So to get the localization done on such a compressed timeline, because our customers generally want the localized versions released on the exact same day, we call it day and date as the original version, we're very close to. It used to be wider windows, but I think the industry has found that, you know, the world is smaller. Everybody's, everybody has access to everything. Uh, so they want it out as quickly as possible. So the actual process for dubbing, you know, to cast voice actors that are appropriate for every role, you're talking about auditioning, you know, you hire a director, the director starts looking at the OV material, thinking about who in that country or area is best suited for different parts. Um, they might sometimes have to get approvals from the studios for who they cast. Other times they have more autonomy on that and they can just move. They, we need access to preliminary versions. So it's not a final edit of the episode or film. Um, and so there's a lot of version control tracking. We want to get a version that's resembling what will be final to them as soon as we can so that they can start casting, um, preparing schedules, have a sense of how many lines it is, um, start translating. But then there's a few different versions that'll go through generally. So you have to, and then you track all the changes. Did the, did certain scenes actually get removed, added? Did any dialogue change and make sure that everybody has access to that information of what's different and what isn't. You go through the um, script translation, and then you go into adaptation, which is really important because you have to adapt the translation to match as best as possible the lip movement. It can obviously take more words to say something if you do a literal translation into a different language, and then you have to take the nuance of lip sync into account. Um, and so you might actually rearrange and change it even more while still making sure that you're capturing the meaning, the intent, um, and that the actor will be able to deliver the emotion. Then you get into the studio, actors, directors, recording lines. Um, they don't have the time you have on the original version. They don't get to do table reads and audition. <laughs> it's, uh, it's usually pretty fast. These dubbing actors are amazing if you ever go into the studios. Um, incredibly professional and talented people. Um, and then once all the recordings come together, they edit, edit it, and it goes to a mixer. Mixer mixes that dialogue in with all the music and effects to make it sound as natural as possible, create that suspension of disbelief that's so important in uh, media content to make you feel like that's, that's the language that was spoken in. Um, and then it hits the distribution chain I talked about, and all those audio versions come into someone like Deluxe, and they get QC'd. Notes go back and forth, fixes get made if needed, and then out to distribution. But yeah, it's a pretty fascinating, fascinating workflow. And so I guess that the timeline compression was probably over the past 10 years with the streamers, right? Though, because I mean, they want to kind of sim release, you know, it's on Netflix. I need it now in 10 dubbed versions already when the original gets released. Was that a big part of that, driving the compression of timeline? When everything started going digital, I think even when you got to DVD and Blu-ray, you started to see some compression, um, but then streaming certainly accelerated it. For theatrical, it's it's been a pretty compressed timeline for a long time. Um, and so because, you know, they want to get the box office, they have like, it's the first window of release. So there, it was more common that you would need all the languages at once historical broadcast oftentimes you would broadcast it in the original version language you might not have even made your licensing deals for distribution elsewhere and at the point when you made that deal <clears throat> the distributor that channel in that country might have been responsible for the localization once you got to dvd blu-ray <clears throat> you got more of the content owners again just like theatrical being responsible for the localization. You know, when it was broadcast, they didn't necessarily always get those foreign language versions even back in their custody, even if legally they were allowed to. Um, but now they were wanted to release discs. They're creating that output for every market generally. And then with streaming, it, it's now it's just like 
theatrical. I mean, every everyone wants everything on the same day, for sure. What were some of the biggest technological kind of improvements over the, let's say, the past three to five years in this process? Because it seems, you know, it's it's very complicated. People can have, I mean, complicated. In the world of translation localization where every, everything's remote, I mean, you still have people coming to a studio, there's a director, there's a ton of people involved. So has there been any kind of top three things in terms of tech that, that made this more efficient over the past three to five years? There have been little things. I, th I think a lot of the process, though, has, hasn't has changed materially. I mean, sure, you might have newer workstations. You might have some plugins that people use to better sync, you know, for the actor, the lip sync. You might have words across the screen. That was common in France, but not as common in other countries. Now you see different countries implementing um, technology to improve the lip sync when actors talk. Um, different cloud tools for the the script writing and the translation steps and then on our side it's the uh the tools for creating the video references as quickly as possible getting them to studios as quickly as possible getting the notes about the changes between versions that's where the acceleration we've focused on mostly has been because you want to just give the creative process as much time as possible. So we have tools, for example, where the studio gives us the video. We have to apply both visual watermarks where it has the name of the studios or the actors plus invisible watermarks in case something gets pirated that it can be traced back. Um, and historically, that, that would take a lot of time, but it's all very automated now. We can churn those out quickly so that you don't lose time. You just want to get those videos in the hands of everybody. Um, try to speed up those non-creative aspects. You said three to five years, though, I think. So I think I have to acknowledge COVID. So there was also the launch of cloud recording during that period. Um, which some people really leaned into during the pandemic. Others, it still it just was too challenging or, you know, different home environments wouldn't have been quiet enough uh, for them to get the quality they wanted. But, but I think that that technology has persisted generally as another tool in the toolbox. Sometimes the actor is traveling, not around, um, we have some productions where actually it's like for animation, you have the same team all the time. Um, and we actually have one where for the English version, the actors are all around the United States and they all have good home studios and everything is cloud recorded every time. They, they love it. They don't have to travel to studios anymore, but that's rare. A lot of times it's specific actors, specific lines that people use it for today. You mentioned lip sync. Um, obviously it's a key, right? I mean, I grew up on German dubbed content and, um, you know, it, it did, I, I, um, what was the term you used? A suspension of disbelief. Yeah, it did suspend uh, the disbelief. Um, but now we have all these tools, uh, tons of AI tools that pretend to be able to do lip sync, like, you know, basically perfectly. So, I mean, is that something you're experimenting with? Do you see this getting broad adoption in the near future or what are your thoughts about that? Yeah, no, I think it's, uh, I think it's interesting. A lot of interest in it. We're doing, we've been doing testing, um, customers are thinking about it and how it, how it would work. Um, there's still a lot to be worked out on workflow and pricing. I think the biggest challenge right now is it adds time to the process. You have to be done with the dub. You have to be done with the dub to make sure you can do that final video dub now, right? Essentially a new version of video with lips that match the dub track. So you need to account for some additional time in the workflow. Um, there's different versions of it and varying degrees of quality. Um, sometimes a lot of it can be automated, but to your point, these are large files and it's different when you're watching like, a user generated piece of content on YouTube versus you sit down to watch, you know, a, a big scripted episodic series or, or a movie, you expect a degree of quality. Um, and when you look at it that way, people get really tuned in on 
the quality. So there are a few companies that are really focused on it for that type of content for theatrical and for, you know, streaming and broadcast that are starting to hit those quality levels. So now it's really about how do you get it into the workflow? You know, can you do it fast enough? Does it meet the economic models of the content owners and distributors? It might force them to change some of those economic models if consumers like it, right? Um, but I think right now it's a lot of testing. It's a lot of evaluation. It's a lot of thinking through how would we make this work? It's actually a major fundamental shift in the distribution supply chain that a lot of people don't think about. Um, the streaming sites and theatrical have really perfected and spent a lot of time working around a single video master with multiple audio and subtitle tracks and a lot of metadata that makes those separate tracks play together. And that's what gives us all the flexibility on streaming platform to just change audio on the fly or change your subtitle language, right? That consumer experience. But it's based on a common video. And so suddenly having a different video file for every version um, is is also an infrastructure thing that has to be thought through. Certainly not impossible, but you still want it to be that seamless. You still want the person at home to be able to switch all those things around. And if every time you switch the language, the video is switching too, it's just something that has to be accounted for. It's a lot more transcoding. Um, it, I could get into how it gets to your home and how the files get near to you, but there's a lot of complexity people don't think about. Um, and it certainly uh, changes that dynamic too. Yeah, that's definitely something people don't think about when they see these like 30 second clips on Twitter or, or on X or YouTube, right? Which are okay, right? For the consumer. But yeah, if you, if you want to do this on a, an ad scale global release in 50 languages or 15 languages, then uh, yeah, very different. Yeah, we had... Um, We had Jonathan Bronfman from Mars uh, on the podcast about uh, mid last year, and I think they they're focusing on the theatrical side of um, of the AI lip sync. So, but that was very interesting. I, I didn't know about all these complexities that actually it filters into all types of distribution issues, and also that it actually would slow it down. That that's something that's not very very intuitive. That this addition would slow down the process materially, right? Yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, though, if If people react to it, if it helps improve that suspension of disbelief, if you get more viewers watching this international content, that's the promise. And I think it's a, I think it's a very interesting area. And I, I, to your point, you, you know, a, a lot of Americans might think, well, if you're, you've been watching dubbed content in German forever, so you just, it's fine to you. But hearing you say, eh, it takes me out of it. It's an important, that's an important note. Like, so if it's possible to have people be more immersed and have it feel like it's their local content, that's pretty exciting. And so if the consumer reaction is strong enough, the industry will work through the technical challenges, right? I think it's a huge function of if you're actually able to, if you understand the original language. So for me, it got harder to accept the German dubs as my English improved. Right, but my kids, they don't care. I mean, they watch it and they, they don't notice. I mean, to them, it's it's fine, right? But to me, I see the lips and that like literally the English speaks to me, like uh, or, you know, underneath the, the German dubs. Well, it's interesting in, in America because uh, dubbing hasn't been common. English dubbing is, yes, on animation, it was happening, but on live action, it's a very new segment, right? A lot of interest, a lot of growth, but um people aren't used to it and so i think it's been interesting the discussion here when you're around the studios is a lot of them are like well if we can get people to watch non-english original version content and this gets them more engaged and gets over that hurdle um, it's a whole new market a huge market for the european and asian original content so like would it allow this content to succeed more it certainly goes both directions but i think because the studios are here so they you know they're, they're also like really looking at it from what imports to the us it's also a very tough audience but if you can hit that bar like you can we can make it work for any language and we had the squid game example right that really went well with the with the english dubs 
I think, I mean, I, I must have watched this dub into English as well. So not German. A lot of people are watching. So that, you know, I think that's going to be the other element that content owners and distributors look at is when they do test it and people are testing it, some of it is out there. Um, it's not that public what's out there, but, and they're going to be looking at the data. Like they're going to do some level of AB testing as best they can and say like, do people hang in longer when we do that? Do they not? Does it actually affect viewership? Right. That, and this is such a data driven world now, but like, and streaming platforms can see all of that. They can see if people watch it all the way through, they can see where they're clicking, what are they doing? And so it's going to be about data, but people will test it. And that's what I mean. If the consumer reaction, if the data shows this matters, then they'll figure it out. Now we're talking about the lip sync, but what about the, uh, the dubbing kind of the AI component of the dubbing? Like, how do you think about that? Where are you experimenting with it? Like just, you know, maybe synthetic voices or maybe even for the translation bit. Is that something that's on the radar or kind of more, yeah, more in an experimental phase at, at this point? I think it, it depends on the content type and, uh, and there's a budget time content type with dimensions to all of this, right? I mean, if you're talking about like start at, at live, if you're talking about live, there's very real applications where humans can't do live dubs into a bunch of languages very easily. I mean, it's just very complicated. So there it becomes an access thing. So you have sports leagues and people like that thinking it'd be pretty great to be able to use this technology um, to have someone speaking in one language, all of our announcers, and then just have the dubs going out so that people around the world, these are big global community events, right? Like a big football soccer match. It's like people are watching it everywhere. That, that's a great, less controversial application because you just can't do it otherwise. Um, I think when it comes to stuff that's more social media or very low budget, they don't dub today. They just don't have the money. They just, they're just financially, there's no economic model. So they're more open to experimenting with it. When it comes to mature dubbing markets where there's established dubbing infrastructure, um, that's where it's, you know, it, that's where it's more of a tool. I think of it more of as, you know, can we solve some of the common pain points in the current production workflow? Like, you know, there's, it's very common that when you're at the mixing stage, something on version control got missed and an actor didn't record a line or you get a last late minute drop in from the original version. There's a new line, there's a new scene and you're at the last hour, that actor is asleep, they're on vacation, <laughs> they're sick. Um, so are there ways that we can integrate it into the workflow to just help with, with the, that real world pain point? of, you know, we just can't, can't get them here. Um, so I think that there's a lot of more practical applications for mature dubbing markets, but is it at the level where it has that human emotion that a dubbing actor has? No, that's my, my view. Um, and those dubbing actors, it's incredible. Like if, you know, you go into, we have studios in Spain, Germany, and France that we own and operate. So I've certainly been there quite a bit. And uh, when the actors come in, I mean, they're, they're, it's just amazing how they can capture that emotion in another language quickly. They can hit that lip sync quickly. I mean, it's there's a lot of nuance, right? It's, it's a creative medium. And I think the creative aspects of dubbing shouldn't be underestimated. So for accessibility, just access to content, maybe opening up new languages that aren't usually dubbed and doing, you know, voiceover dubs or just a, a lower quality dub. I can see people testing that. Um, but I don't see it replacing human voice actors. I think that there is a, I mean, there's an emotional performance there. And like any, I think of it like music sampling technology. I don't know if you, like if you, <laughs> If you play music, you know, people have keyboards and they're like, oh, now it'll sound like a guitar or whatever. But 
the performance is what matters. And even, even if you have the best emulation software, this will make it sound like I'm playing a totally different guitar. Well, if you don't play the guitar well, if the performance isn't there, it doesn't matter that you can make it sound like something else. It's still not, you, you missed the nuance of the performance, right? So performance nuance is important. I mean, technology moves fast. We don't know where it's all going to go, but um, personally, I also just think with AI, people jump to the most complex things. And do we really want to automate human creativity? I mean, it's like, that's kind of an essential part of humanity. <laughs> and I and I do think dubbing is a creative industry and creative localization is creative, right? The technology can get objective things done. Like you could say, yes, that's an accurate translation, but will it have the interpretation that a human has? Um, we see generative AI, you see examples of it, but they're inconsistent and they're not always reliable, right? It's still a machine. It's not a, a human. Um, but we'll see where it all goes. I, I don't know. No, but I also like what you said about, I mean, let's say an actor is away or there's like a last second fix and the, the, the voice actor can't be reached. So it kind of takes it out of this binary question of like, it's all going to be AI and fully automated and you click a button versus like there's this kind of clunky old world where still people have to do it, right? I mean, so, you know, there are use cases, even in your highly complex world, maybe for, for some of these technologies right now, even in those very mature markets, but it's not like clicking a button and replacing uh, anything there. Uh, can you talk a bit about this? Uh, and I, I'm not sure how you guys pronounce this. SAG Oftra or SAG Oftra or what's the name of this union? SAG. How, how do people say that? Yes, Screen Actors Guild. So SAG. We say SAG Oftra here. SAG Oftra. All right. So they uh, they went on strike. That wasn't a pleasant time for anybody in the media business. And now they're back. But and they got a ton of concessions. One of them, and we just covered it this week, was like their. Uh, they got it in writing that voice actors have to be humans. Like that's that's how they put it. But then they also said there that those same voice actors would get royalties on uh, international version. They said digitally altered into foreign languages versions, which to me would imply that basically they're getting compensated if their voice is being used for AI dubbing, if that were to happen, right? So just... Tell me a bit about your thinking here. I mean, this seems very hard to parse from the outside. So on the one hand, I mean, obviously they're trying to get the best for their members, but looks like the kind of the dubbing world wouldn't be very much in favor of this. I'm not sure if that's a correct take. I think it comes down to your own likeness, right? I don't think any of us would want to wake up tomorrow and turn on TV and say, wait, that's my voice. I had no idea they were going to use my voice or that's a digital video image of me. And that's really the thing that people are fighting to protect the most. And so, you know, if you think about um, the voice of Brad Pitt in Italy or Germany or France or Japan, right? There is a voice actor who's been cast in that. That's the voice that those, the people who watch the dub content are used to. It's not Brad Pitt's voice. What they're trying to protect is if it literally sounds like Brad Pitt in that language, then Brad Pitt should have knowledge about that and an opportunity to be compensated. I think right for compensation is negotiable, right? I mean, it's just it's just acknowledging that like that is their voice, that is their likeness, and you have to have permission and it needs to be part of the the remuneration conversation. Um, I don't think that's surprising to the studios, honestly. And it's, um, it's the same kind of thing that we're seeing uh, the concern for in the dubbing community, right? Like dubbing voice actors want, uh, like in Spain, there's a lot of conversation right now about we, we don't want people using our voice to create artificial versions without us knowing about it that's what they that's what they're looking to protect it's just like an awareness like this is my human likeness and when i went to the studio i thought it was for this movie or this show and i want some acknowledgement for that those are the kinds of things people are fighting for so it doesn't necessarily mean it'll never happen it's just with consent with knowledge um 
with remuneration if that's what that voice actor requires, right? Um, and I, I think we'll see we'll see that in every industry, right? People want to have control of themselves. They even said like it doesn't have to sound exactly like the original. Like it just has to be plausible that it could be that original. So they they you know put a pretty big kind of circle around that that core. Uh, yeah, these these are the big questions. Uh, big questions as these models get so so good, uh, and especially in voice. I mean, you know, maybe even two or three years ago, those kind of text to speech was just not there at all. But now with things like Eleven Labs, you're like, oh, okay, that actually starts to sound very much like a human. Uh, not the emotion, I get it, but like just kind of reading off a script, it gets it's getting quite good. It is. I mean, emotive AI is definitely getting better. So. Um... Yeah, I mean, it. you can't slow down technology, right? But we're going to have these debates. And uh, to your point, the fact that they put in language of just resembling, well, that's a common part of dubbing voice casting today. So that, that kind of thing is where it, it might get tricky. And there will be some debate, right? And um, some of these things end up, sadly, getting settled in court. It's like music, right, where people say, well, that sounds like my song. And sometimes you listen and you go, man, that sounds identical. I understand why that case is. And then sometimes they'll lose that court case. Other cases, I think, that didn't sound that similar, and they'll win. So there's an element of human interpretation <laughs> as well to these things, right? It's, it's tough. How do you think about YouTube creators as a new client segment, potentially? Because YouTube has been kind of teasing everybody with this multi-audio track thing for, like, I think, must be two years now, but I still only see it with Mr. Beast and like two other like hundred million dollar subscriber um, creators. Is that something you're watching if, if they're ever going to open it up? Yeah, I mean, we have some social media content creators as clients today for traditional dubbing. Um, but generally, it's the most successful people who are making like real money on it, right? Um, because they have they have the confidence that they can monetize that investment. Um, but a lot of user generated content, it's, it's, they don't make anything. They certainly don't make enough to be paying for a professional dub. So that's, that's an area where I see people going with more automated dubbing solutions because it's just not economically plausible for them right now. Right. They don't, they just don't make that return or certainly not a guaranteed return. So it's just way too much upfront investment. Um, but it is happening and that we do have some customers who do it the traditional way. And then we have some who are interested, but traditional is too expensive. And so they're testing more automated to see is there something that makes it feasible for them to hit, hit more people, right? More audiences with, with their content. So to close, what are some of the things that are on your roadmap? Uh, some key things you're planning this year with the company, with with AppTech, maybe. Well, certainly with AppTech, you know, we're working on uh, more tightly integrating the tools. Uh, we have various customers who want to test different things. Live is of a lot of interest to our customers, um, and just improving the quality. I mean, timelines are challenging. So even for a traditional translation workflow for subtitling we've had translation aid tools for years but the higher the quality the more concise they are it allows translators to work faster under tight deadlines focus more on the lines where they have to really transcreate if you want to use that term right and and really capture the nuance but worry less about the easy stuff um, and then for more budget conscious people we we think that it'll open up more languages um they might we don't have that many who want to go fully automated just like spit out the mt but doing a machine translation with a post edit certainly makes it faster it has a different price point um and so people are interested in those solutions and i think it'll open up more language coverage and i'm hopeful that the future has a more hyper localized aspect so we start getting into dialects and we start getting into um, more precise, you know, it's like neutral Spanish, Latin American Spanish. Nobody speaks that. Um, same with Arabic, neutral Arabic. Nobody speaks that. <laughs> and so, um, so maybe there's a world where you spend a lot of time 
on a neutral version and you use technology to create different dialect versions and you get closer to what people speak. Um, so new languages, more hyper localization to hit different dialects. Um, I think a lot of content owners and distributors are interested in that, but it's all about a scale and a price matrix. So there's a place for the traditional workflows, place for new workflows. There's a lot of in-between applications. And so we're excited to explore that with localization professionals, our customers. And I think um I think there's an exciting future. A lot of a lot of different options. It's not so binary, like you said. It's not all this or all that. There's a lot of in between. I look forward to Avatar in Swiss German then, maybe in 2026 or something. <laughs> Why not? Why not? Right? <laughs> it would be possible. It would be it would be marginally weird, but uh, it would be possible. It's 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 like a semi language, but it does it does hit a little closer to the heart if it's in Swiss German than in like uh, standard German to us here in Switzerland. So there you go. It's it's a, the new it's the new variation that I need to use when I talk to people as the example Swiss German. All right, Chris, that was fascinating. Thank you so much for taking the time today. Thank you. Really appreciate it.